All righty. Good morning. Happy Friday to everyone. Thanks for joining us. Uh, my name is Alex Staff. I'm the Director of Technology Policy at the Progressive Policy Institute here in Washington, D.C. We're a uh, center-left uh, moderate think tank. We cover almost every policy area you can think of, but today we're talking about the future of the gig economy and a new vision for workers. And so I'd have two great guests. I'll be moderating a conversation between them. I might jump in and add some thoughts as we go along as a moderator's prerogative. Um, but first I'll hand it off to Jennifer Huddleston um, from the American Action Forum to introduce herself. Hi, I'm Jennifer Huddleston and I'm the Director of Technology and Innovation Policy at the American Action Forum. We're a center-right think tank um, covering a wide range of issues. My research focuses primarily on the intersection of law and technology, including a lot of issues very relevant to the gig economy or the sharing economy. All right, and then Michael Mandel from PPI. Yeah, thanks very much, Alec. Uh, I'm Mike Mandel. I'm the Chief Economic Strategist at PPI. Um, I'm also Senior Fellow at the Wharton School uh, Mac Institute of Innovation Management. I do a lot of work in innovation and growth, and um, I recently wrote a paper on uh, uh, the labor market for gig workers. Fantastic. So I'll kind of kick us off here and hopefully we can set the table for the audience. So Jennifer, I'll shoot the first question to you. What are some of the regulations related to gig workers in the US at the federal and state level? And then how might those regulations impact innovation? We've seen a real explosion in a lot of different app Based platforms from work, things that many of us now see in our everyday lives like Uber and Lyft, but also a wider range that we might not necessarily think about in the moment. Things like TaskRabbit if you move into a new apartment that can help you set up your furniture or various apps that may be able to have a hairdresser come to your house and do your hair before a, a big event. So we've really seen that as a result of a lot of innovation in the app space, as well as people looking for different kinds of work arrangements, both now during the pandemic, as well as before, that we, this new market has kind of emerged that allows more independence, but at the same time really serves some needs that consumers had, whether it's delivery or getting from point A to point B, or just finding someone to, to help you out with a, a task that may be difficult for, for you to do yourself. At the same time though, we have started to see some questions, particularly around some of the labor issues that have arisen with these apps. So one of the most notable state laws we've heard a lot about is AB5, which really was looking at reclassifying a lot of these workers into a more traditional employee model. Now, I know we'll talk about this more throughout the presentation, but there's a lot of reasons why some of these workers may not have wanted to have that traditional employment model, whether they're just doing this on the side in addition to another job, or whether they enjoy the flexibility of working for multiple apps or various other reasons. We've also seen some potential proposals at a federal level, things like the PRO Act that would, again, be looking at reclassifying these workers, as well as promoting potentially union opportunities for unionization. We've also seen, though, some incidents around the Department of Labor and the definition of independent contractors that are trying to make sure that workers that want the, these type of opportunities have that flexibility to pursue them. We've also heard some talk about, are there other options, ways that could provide workers with, say, a menu of options to find those benefits that they do need while still maintaining that large degree of flexibility that is part of the reason that attracts many workers to this type of work. Fantastic. So I think that kind of did a great job laying out what the, why people might be pursuing gig work, uh, especially in this uh, the current economy we face, uh, and some of the proposed regulations that we've seen in nationwide and the ones that are already in effect in California. And so, Michael, now can you talk about, I know that a lot of people are talking about, they see some of the benefits of gig work, they view it as like kind of insecure in a sense. It doesn't come with a lot of the benefits that traditional work, traditional employment um, came with in the past. And so I'm curious, and I know you've written about this recently as well, what are some policy levers we can pull to secure benefits for gig workers without compromising that flexibility, if that's possible? 
Well, Alec, you know, you, you, of course you know because you wrote the paper with me. Okay, you, <laughs> you gave it away. That was our secret, Michael. <laughs> Look, there, there's a there there's there's an issue with gig workers, which is that people have a feeling that gig workers are being cheated out of their benefits. They feel like that for whatever reason that that one of the reasons why companies like the gig economy is they don't have to pay benefits to workers, and and so part of the pressure to sort of change the laws has to do with making sure that these workers are taken care of. Now, when 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 you and I uh, when you and I looked at this, we sort of you know found out something very interesting. And actually, let's just just point out when we're talking about benefits here, we're talking about principally unemployment, health, and retirement. There's other benefits as well, but those are, those are the main ones. And so you you look and you sort of say, what's going on here? And, and what we discovered was that um, that gig workers are at a disadvantage because of the tax laws. You know, when when a company, for example, funds a retirement plan, it gets to pay for those retirement benefits with pre-tax dollars. But the way that the tax law is written, if you as a gig worker tries to set up your own retirement account, you're paying for that with post-tax dollars. The same thing for health care. Unemployment is a different issue. We can get to that a little bit later. Um, but so... What's happening at this point is that because of the way the tax laws have been written and rewritten over the years, that gig workers are at a structural disadvantage, not because of what the companies are doing, but because of the way the federal government has set up the laws. And so what we suggested, among other things in our papers, we suggested changing the laws to set up a level playing field for independent workers and employees. It's really pretty straightforward to do that. And it has the effect that you'll, you, you'll be able to sort of, if you're an independent worker, fund your own benefits without the tax disadvantages that you had before. Now we can talk about more details about this, but that's, that's getting uh, you know, uh, you know, almost too deep um, at this point. And the other thing is, is that will enable companies to actually help fund those without um, one directly or indirectly uh, without running into tax problems. So this is something that has to be done at the federal level to set up a level, level playing field. Once you've done that, then a lot of the other issues become second order, second order issues fixable by twiddling with regulations and so forth. Uh, the, the one big issue, benefit that's hard to fix that way is unemployment insurance. But we discovered in the pandemic that Congress, when it was forced to, was able to figure out how to give unemployment benefits to independent workers as well. So now we have this example that you can, that you can get around that problem. So what you and I were suggesting, Alec, was fixing the tax laws. And then once you fix the tax laws, being able to set up the, a menu of benefits that put um, the uh, uh, um, independent workers and employees on the same on the same footing. Gotcha. Uh, very very good summary. And I think just to play devil's advocate here for a minute, uh, I think probably when we were developing this proposal and discussing it with people, two of the most common criticisms or pieces of feedback people gave us or concerns they might have about this proposal is one: if you're messing with the tax code, you want to make these benefits tax advantage. Is that going to cost a ton of money? Uh, can we afford that? Is that the right thing to do? Uh, and two, if you're mandating benefits, so that's ob obligatory or it's opt-in, opt-out, if these companies do opt-in to provide these kind of, if gig companies opt-in to provide benefits to independent workers, will it just come out of their cash salary? Will it just reduce their cash benefits proportionally and the workers aren't, aren't better off? And so what do you say to those, those two kind of criticisms? Well, I think what's, what's important to realize is that what the counterfactual is. If the counterfactual is moving these independent workers onto it, forcing them to become employees, then you're, what you're doing is you're actually forcing them into the company framework where they are tax advantaged then. And it's the same loss to the, to the government, um, uh, government coffers one way or the other. Uh, I think that, that what's important to sort of to realize here is that on the basis of fairness, we have to 
readjust the tax laws so that people who want flexibility are not penalized for it. And we would expect in the end that the, um, uh, we would expect in the end that the labor market would adjust in such a way that the, the pay would be higher for the independent workers to sort of compensate for this. Okay. But they can't do this with if the tax laws are against them. Right, exactly. Like this, yeah. Yeah, Let me jump in really quick here. I think another thing that's important to recognize in some of these conversations about what benefits might be offered or, or how can we offer these workers in the sharing economy more opportunities to find the benefits that are the right fit for them. So we also want to structure where co these companies that are offering these app-based platforms and this independent work can offer additional benefits without being worried that offering those benefits is going to be used against them to consider these workers to be employees rather than independent contractors. So that if in the case of the pandemic, they want to offer their workers sick leave or offer their workers um, you know, additional PPE options, that they're able to do that without being worried that by offering someone who's using their platform that opportunity, that they're now going to be considered an employee and have the additional labor requirements and additional taxation requirements that come with that. I, th I think that's a really good point. I mean, our purpose in writing this paper was to, to sort of propose a situation that made workers better off, okay? And independent, make worker, independent workers better off. And there's, right, there was two points to that. One was, one was changing the tax laws. And the other was, as you said, uh, making sure that companies that wanted to offer benefits to the independent workers that were aff affiliated with them could do that without being additionally penalized. And in our view, we would we said that, look, that companies could choose a regulatory regime that enabled them to do this if they were willing to commit to sort of putting a certain amount of money in. And so it all the different pieces fit together. It's a, it's a regime where they're not in danger of losing the flexibility. They can fund the benefits themselves without having an extra tax consequence. And the companies can fund benefits, or have to sort of you know, provide a minimum set of benefits, including occupational health insurance. Exactly. And I think just, to, yeah. And just, and just add one, yeah, I think an important part of our framework that we're doing here and, and why we think it's an opt-in framework that could benefit companies that opt into it, but we don't want every single company, the Walmarts, the Starbucks of the world to dump all their employees in this, into this framework is because to get the benefits of the tax advantage, to get tax advantage benefits for these gig workers, the companies have to commit to no control of hours. So they're still classified as independent contractors and they can't put any non-competes in place. So they're allowed to work for multiple gig companies at the same time, which is a key feature of this, of this economy, right? Absolutely. Now, having non-competes is really important as part of this. Right, exactly. And so, Jennifer, I know that you're coming at this from the center right. Uh, you focus a lot of your work on innovation in the sharing economy. So I'm curious, what, if anything, from your perspective, needs to be changed in regards to regulation of the gig workers to help continue innovation in the sharing economy? As I said earlier, we've really seen an explosion in the range of these platforms that are available now. Of It's very easy for, for this conversation to just become about Uber, Lyft, and DoorDash, but the gig economy, the sharing economy, whatever term you want to use for it is far bigger than just those few larger platforms. So when we're thinking about the workers, we also want to think about what would this mean not only for these kind of existing players in the market, but what would it mean for new players entering the market? So if I want to start a sharing economy service for cat sitting, what does that mean that as a new app-based platform that is offering a way for people who already do this service to provide their service to others that I have to have in order? Does it mean that I am basically opening my own business and have to fully hire employees and you know, oh, go through all the, the processes that are involved with that? Well, that may be a deterrent to someone starting a new app-based platform. At the same time, it's the type of 
time when a lot of people are reevaluating what they want from a, a work environment, whether they want more flexibility or they're looking at kind of putting together several different independent jobs to both fill their time and to, to provide for themselves or their families in, in this kind of economic downturn. So when we look at things like AB5 or the PRO Act that have these really heavy reclassifications, we don't only want to think about what does that mean for large sharing platform economies that currently exist, but what might that mean for a new platform that wants to allow people to offer their talents or their skills in a, in a new way? What sort of barriers or deterrents might that make to, for people having those work opportunities? Also, as I mentioned in a little bit in our previous conversation, we want to think about what this means for people who want to offer their workers more. Are there ways that we can create regulations where by offering my uh, offering the workers on my platform, offering the people who are providing their skills on my platform, educational benefits or opportunities to buy into health insurance or to earn sick leave or, or whatever menu of benefits I want to offer that I'm not risking again having to go through a, a complete reclassification when people are, are willingly selecting into those benefits. When I don't have that traditional employee-employer relationship, I'm not going through a, a hiring process. I'm really providing more of a opportunity for those services. Because it's also important to remember that a lot of people are on these platforms for a lot of different reasons. So you may have, you know, a college kid who's walking dogs in their spare time on Rover and is still on their parents' health insurance. So doesn't really need that health insurance option and would rather maybe have a option that was vacation time or was a you know credit towards a retirement account or was even credit towards school or, or something like that. On the other hand, you may have someone who this is their, their full-time job, they're really engaged and maybe they're working on multiple of these platforms. And so they want their health insurance through one platform and they want as their benefit option through one platform and they want their you know retirement account as their benefit through another and their vacation days as a, a benefit through this one that they only do every now and then or something like that. So I think that we could see you know, a, a range of options that were offered by people that wanted to provide greater benefits and not really go into that cookie cutter mold that so many times the legislation that claims to help workers is really forcing on both companies and workers. And what we've seen is as innovation has changed our relationship with work, changed our relationship with so many different things that we're seeing changes where individuals are seeking somewhat new models so that they're not necessarily in that nine to five mold. They're not necessarily with a, a single platform. And so how can we help ensure both that there's the flexibility to encourage more opportunities at this time for individuals, as well as to allow individuals to find those opportunities that best suit their needs? Well, Jennifer, I'm really glad you, you framed it that way because we have a plan for you. Uh, I think a, a lot of the details in our proposal, and I'll, and I'll have Michael explain them to the audience, uh, I think fit pretty neatly with that in terms of we agree that it's one size fits all for benefits is not the solution today. And so we kind of frame our plan in, in terms of a cafeteria style plan where workers can choose benefits. So Michael, if you could talk more about how we start, we're thinking about those problems and how like, the nitty gritty of how workers get benefits, who manages them, that sort of thing. Well, that, that's the whole point is that we have to have a way to not, not to provide an easy way for them to get benefits without tying it to a particular type of work structure. So we were talking about a cafeteria style plan that would uh, be managed separately from the companies. Uh, and the companies, if they sort of chose this regulatory regime would sort of have to pay in a certain amount relative to the amount of time that they worked for that platform, but they could work for several platforms and it would, it would, you know, this, this is something that would not have been possible several years ago, but we've been able to, what we've seen is that because of the advances in information technology, it becomes much cheaper to, to set up a company that can just manage benefits. And this is what we would imagine happening is that, you know, the company that you contract with would 
pay in this money into sort of some third party that would manage the benefits for them in a, in a cafeteria way. And once again, the, 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 you know, we're sort of talking about potentially healthcare, we're talking about, we're talking about um, occupational insurance, uh, though that may be a separate category unto itself, because one of the things that uh, independent workers did miss was the ability to have collective, to have, <laughs> to be able to get workers comp relatively easily. And, uh, you know, having tried this myself when I was sort of running my own company, it was, it's, a, it's an interesting experience. Um, but, um, and then you sort of have a variety of other potential benefits, including the ability to sort of, re including retirement benefits, funding retirement plans, the ability to take time off and so forth. And so this becomes more expansive rather than uh, uh, narrower. Gotcha. I, I think one of the important things there too is the way that it is an option for the companies as well, because again, that may depend on the nature and size of your company. If you're a very small platform that say is effectively a message board for babysitting, that's going to be a very different relationship that you may have and that you're the people using your platform may expect than if you are a company that has developed a, a more wider range of services and where people are, are using this platform in a different way. So having, again, that way for new platforms to, to come up and see if there's a demand, see if this is something that people want to offer services for without necessarily, again, having that immediate regulatory burden of having to it, it just by offering the opportunity to offer these services, have everyone classified as employees. So, so Jennifer, I, I, I disagree. I, sorry, I agree with everything that you're saying, but I want to just make it, make it really clear that from our perspective, that um, our plan was aimed towards making workers better off, making independent workers better off. Okay, and it was. Uh, and let me just finish. Okay, sort of. So, you know, Alec and I sort of sat down with this originally, and we sort of said, how can we make sure? that this is really going to be a plus. And that's kind of why we started from the place that we started from. You, in order to, from, from a political perspective, in order to sort of make something like this fly, you need to be able to be convincing to, uh, uh, to the various groups that this will in fact make independent workers better off. It is completely true that as a first order effect, making it easier for New startups is important as well, but coming out of the pandemic, we are concerned that uh, that people are not being taken advantage of. Well, and I would just add that I think the reason we want to make it easier for startups is not out of a making it good for business, but what that innovation and benefits does do both for workers and for consumers as a whole. That having those opportunities available also benefits workers, also provides necessary services to those workers who are in turn using those benefits. And so I that, that would be the reason I would, would mention that this whole ecosystem, the, the concerns with the kind of top-down approach, one size fits all, that we see with something like AB5 trying to reclassify workers, is that it actually lost a lot of opportunities for workers as well. Not just even from these traditional sharing economy platforms, but from some industries that have had a, a long tradition of freelance or independent work. Things like um, freelance journalists or, or truck drivers who may have chosen this arrangement for a long time that are now trying to, to figure out how this new classification works. So I, I completely agree, we want everyone to be in a, a relationship where they feel that their opportunity for work works for them for, for lack of a better way of putting it. But we also wanna make sure that there are opportunities for people to provide more opportunities for people to work in a way that is beneficial to that individual. Right, so I, I think we kind of had a moment of disagreement there, and then unfortunately, you guys started to agree again, which I don't, I don't like. For uh, we could, clicks. we could disagree some more if you, if you want, Alec. I exactly. Think, so, yeah. I think a Go lot ahead, of the disagreement is 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 about emphasis. Okay, mm -hmm. from a from 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 you know in a world in which impl, impl, workers have been hit very hard by the pandemic, 
you know, making sure that we are making policy changes that are improvement for them first and foremost is high up in everybody's mind. And I agree with you completely, Jennifer, about, I mean, I don't have a, an ounce of disagreement about what you, anything that you said. I think that kind of, be, it's interesting what you said about the consumers, right? because one of the complaints about, let's go back to the Uber and Lyft, is that, is that consumers got low prices on the back of the, on the back of the workers. And by delving into this, we've been able to sort of understand some of the structural reasons that were not connected with companies, but were actually connected with the tax laws. And this, this you know, is not something that can be dealt with on the state level, which is why AB5 is, you know, is kind of beside the point, basically. Um, it's not, you know, if you go ahead and start doing reclassification, you're not actually fixing anything. What you need to do is you actually look to sort of say, why is it that, that these people are being forced to compete on a non-level playing field by decisions that were made by their elected representatives? Right, and I think, I think just to kind of, I think another question that might highlight differences or differences in approaches or perspectives or emphasis, um, I'm curious to get both of your answer on this question. So does the lack of benefits for gig workers qualify as a market failure in your opinion? Jennifer, I'll let you start first. Well, my background is as a lawyer, so I have to give that classic lawyer answer. Oh. It depends. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think that th this, this is a very complicated market. And that would be something that I would really emphasize is we have seen so many changes just in, in how we approach work and, and the way, particularly, you know, millennials and, and the next generation view how they put together a job or, or what opportunities are available to them. And some people would say for worse and some people would say for, for better, you know, we've seen that some people really value that flexibility and independence that comes with the current situation. We have seen people that express concerns that, you know, are, are well-meaning concerns about what do we do about the gap? What do we do about people who, who fall in this situation where this isn't a side hustle for them, this is full-time work. It's a, a question of what do, you know, what, what, what do we do when this is someone's only employment? And how do we create a situation where those people still feel like they are able to thrive and are not, not having to deal with some of these concerns and, and to kind of Michael's point that, that people who are concerned about those individuals aren't concerned about using these, these products. I would suggest that there are multiple options, um, so not not to not to avoid the the market failure question, but that it's not as clear cut as a yes or no. There is a market failure on this particular benefit that we have to really look at the complexities of the situation, and as a result, it's also not as clear cut of a policy solution. Of if we just flip a switch and make everyone a traditional worker, that that will solve the market failure benefits problem. Or if we just have companies offer health insurance, that will solve the market benefits problem. It's, it, it's a, a much more complicated situation that is actually very individual. And I would also argue very company specific as well in terms of how the people using that platform use that platform. Okay, so it's not a presidential debate, so I won't hold your feet to the fire for a yes or no. I'll take the pens. Uh, Michael, same question. Does the lack of benefits for gig workers qualify as a market failure? I think you're muted. There's a, there's a, there's a huge market failure there in unemployment insurance. And unemployment insurance really the, 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 you know, requires special treatment unto itself. So the conventional view of unemployment insurance is that you pay in you know, the, your company, you pay in money, and then it's, it, your company is rated by, by the amount of uh, people that, it, that take unemployment insurance and, and it's an industry rating. And then it's all supposed to balance out in the end. The problem is, is that what Congress has done in recessions, it has tossed tens or hundreds of billions of dollars into the unemployment insurance system that was not paid for by unemployment insurance premiums. So, up to now, it in fact has been true that if you were not in the unemployment insurance system, you were, you were losing. 
because anybody who was in it would get the potential benefits of the extra money that Congress put in. Well, in the pandemic, they proved that it is possible to pay unemployment insurance benefits to independent workers. And we know this actually from some European countries too, but Congress just went ahead and did it. So they've actually solved an important problem for independent workers, which nobody had a good solution to before, which is how to make sure that they get protected against these large systemic shocks to the economy that hit both to hit both employees and independent workers, and then independent workers didn't have protection against. Well, now they have now they have protection. We can find we can we can fine tune it. Then there's the sort of the small shocks, you know, about companies that go out of business or have to lay off people under normal circumstances, and those those are not a market failure. Those can be taken care of in other ways, you know. And Alec, you and I sort of talked about the ability to sort of take some of that money that the company was putting into the cafeteria plan and reposition that as if you sort of had a sickness in the family, they had to sort of take some time off from your independent work that this was a means of compensation. We have some details in our paper about this, but all of a sudden the biggest market failure of all, which was the unemployment insurance is not the problem that it once was. Gotcha. I'm gonna invoke moderator's prerogative again to add my own two cents on this question. I think it's even a little broader. I agree with you that unemployment assistance may be the biggest market failure here, but I think I would argue things like sick, sick time, time off for sick days, health insurance and retirement savings might, might also qualify. On the sick days stuff, I think the pandemic is a great example of that. Like there are huge negative externalities, negative spillovers when a sick employee comes into work, especially if they work in the service industry and they might uh, get a lot of customers sick and the individual employee does not bear that cost, but consumers bear that cost, the business as a whole bears that cost. And so, um, and the gig economy subsidizing via tax advantage benefits, paid time off, I think is a good idea to fix that market failure. And then I think people are overall roughly rational, but they're not hyper rational. They have good evidence people uh, have too high of a discount rates, meaning they underrate the future. And so they don't properly save for retirement on their own. And it's probably a good idea to have tax incentives um, for future retirement savings as well. So I think a lot of market failures, I think, support the kind of proposals we put forward. Uh, so now let's pivot to uh, state versus federal issues. And so I think our audience, if they're following the news, they've always probably heard of AB5. Maybe they've heard of Prop 22 in California. So Jennifer, I'll shoot this question to you. What is Prop 22? Uh, and is it a good solution for fixing what's wrong with AB5? So Prop 20, we so to start with AB5 was this law passed in California that required change kind of the test to some degree for, for independent workers. Most people point to it being largely targeted to towards Uber and Lyft, the ride sharing companies in the state that was going to require that they reclassify their workers and employees. Um, but it had a lot of other effects. We've seen a lot of news stories about people who were independent contractors in other areas that also found that they were really struggling to have the same opportunities that they had of, again, those journalists that got laid off of, you know, a lot of people who were, had set up several different independent um, opportunities as a way of making things work for themselves and their families that were no, no longer able to pursue the independent opportunities because companies at times were more hesitant of taking on independent contractors because of how this reclassification worked. Prop 22 attempts to, to change that and to get rid of this kind of cookie cutter mold of, of what the classification would look like. Again, looking a lot at those platform economy based ride hailing companies, a lot of these other companies that have really struggled in light of this. One of the things to note too is that prior to when, when AB5 was looking at being enforceable, we actually saw Uber and Lyft say that they might, felt that they might have to pull out of California. Um, prior to a judge staying in order, I mean, they, there was a 12-hour period where it looked like ride sharing might no longer be available to the consumers in, in California. And we certainly care about the about workers having the, the right opportunities. But if you think about what that impact could have on other workers as well, who would be who have been relying on this, not only for their income, but for their mode of transportation, you could see huge dramatic shifts. 
We've also seen that other states have proposed similar laws kind of modeled after AB5. I know New Jersey has considered other issues related to kind of this classification. And so I think there are a lot of questions and concerns about what this could mean on a, a state by state level for the app economy, particularly if I'm not sure, you know, if I am doing this in Virginia and, and particularly since we're all in the DC area, if, if Virginia and Maryland have different classification laws, then I as a worker may be confused about what I can do and what and what my relationship with the, with the platform that I'm using for that work looks like. It also could create some disruptive problems in terms of one of the benefits of these apps was their ability to cross state lines in some case, their ability to offer opportunities that weren't available because of restrictive licensing laws in more traditional ways of these platforms operating. So to use the ride sharing example, if you lived in DC prior to ride sharing and ever had the experience of trying to get a cab from DC to Virginia or Maryland or back to DC from Virginia or Maryland, it was very difficult to convince a cab driver to take you because of how the restrictions worked. Then these app forms came along and it was much easier because the driver could decide if they were willing to drive that far, if you know there, there weren't these restrictions in terms of the zones and all these other issues that occurred in this kind of traditional industry. And so it was really a way of kind of overcoming some of those barriers that had prevented consumers and workers from having more flexibility and choice in terms of providing such a service. Thanks for that. that the, you're a great job explaining what's going on with Prop 22 and AB5. So now I'll kind of apply this to Michael and our proposal. So Michael, question for you is Prop 22 passes in November in California. Do we no longer need a federal solution? Is, is our solution moot? Um, is this a state level issue, a federal level issue? How do we, how right, do we think I about think, that? I think, Alec, that you and I identified that this is a federal level issue. It's a problem with the federal tax laws and there's very little that can be done on the state level to to fix it, that that it's just uh, you know moving around deck chairs basically. I mean, I'm you know obviously you know I'm sort of talking about something like AB five, which is that if part if the, it's a it's a you know the equivalent of a pro crusty in bed where you're trying to sort of stretch the independent workers to sort of fit the fit the um, uh, the, the the categories that existed before. What we really have to do is we have to make the changes on the federal level to put them on a put the independent workers on a level playing field with the uh, with with employees, and then we can sort of see, you know, we, we may need to sort of trim around the edges to see how to make this work out right. Uh, but but right now there's just no way to fix it on the state level. And if I could jump in here, I think that there are times when states are doing great things to provide workers lower barriers to entry, to provide workers more opportunities to pursue their passions, to have these opportunities. And, you know, as we mentioned, more opportunities for innovators to provide these platforms. But I do think there are times when there is a federal role, whether it is via these existing federal roles that we've traditionally seen of, are there barriers in the tax code? Are there barriers in federal definitions that are preventing workers and, and employers from providing the opportunities that workers want? Are there, are there issues that are preventing these platforms from emerging so that people can have the opportunities to work that they want? And are there times when states are, are so disruptive that we need to consider if there's a role for the federal go government to overcome that disruption as well? Great, and so I think we'll, I'll give you each the same final question and then we'll go to Q&A. Uh, so I think people can, one person's already asked a question, everyone feel free to add your questions right now while they're, they're answering my final question and then we can wrap up after that. So for the final question, I think the thing that's on everyone's mind these days, COVID-19, uh, I'm curious to get both perspective, Michael, have you answer first, is should the pandemic affect or change how we are thinking about gig workers in the gig economy? That's a great question, Alec, and it's, it's, it's at the top of uh, our mind all the time, which is that coming out of coming out of the coming out of the pandemic, we're going to have a situation of it's still going to be great uncertainty. Uh, companies are going to companies and I mean, companies includes businesses, small businesses are going to be thinking about: Do we want to hire this worker? Is 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 COVID nineteen going to come back again? Is this is this 
gain temporary or permanent. All right. And so we're going to see a situation where the more that we allow businesses to hire workers, allow more or, you know, on a contingent basis, on a gig basis, and maybe hire is not the right word, obviously, but, but the more flexibility we have, the faster that we're going to create work for people and we're going to create economic growth. So this is precisely the wrong time to be, uh, be instituting uh, more regulations on the labor market. Fantastic. Uh, Jennifer, same question to you. Should the pandemic affect how we we're thinking about gig workers? I think the pandemic has affected the way a lot of individuals think about their own work, whether it's they're now working from home instead of going into an office, whether it's a they've found that they need increased flexibility because of their own situation. So maybe they're looking for an alternative work arrangement, more independent and, or things like that. I think it also may have changed what people want out of it, out of their own work and their own relationship potentially with a with a platform or with a more formal employer. And so I think that it's not so much that the pandemic has changed the need for for any kind of regulation or, or non regulation, as much as it is that the way that we are all thinking and experiencing different elements of the pandemic have forced us to really reevaluate in some ways where we see our own future going, where we see the future of work going, where we see what we value and what benefits matter most to us. Great. And so I think I, looking at the chat, I see one question. Uh, it's more of a comment. And so I'm going to read the comment and then I, I can actually address it myself because it's pretty interesting. So we have a from Austin Bannon uh, said, government policies have created distinct employee, independent contractor, and other categories. Then certain policies are mandated for those classes. A solution for independent contractors or self-employed is to allow but not mandate access to benefits through employers and to provide the same tax benefits preferences outside of traditional employment. Independent contractors could join groups to purchase insurance, uh, for instance, personal unemployment, savings account, perhaps something that can be transitioned to over the current state-run systems that are subsidized by the federal government. Well, I have good news for you, Austin. If you haven't read our paper yet, this is basically what Michael and I um, suggest in our framework and an a vision for um, independent workers. The idea is that there's an opt-in system. So companies will opt in to provide these kind of benefits. But then once you're working as a gig worker for these companies, you get to do exactly this. You get the exact same benefits um, that employees do without becoming converted to a full-time employee. Um, and they're portable, they accrue proportionally to your earnings, you can take them from, from company to company. Um, and then it's, and in a lot of ways, it is, is this new vision for independent workers. And so I think you'll, you'll like what you see in our proposal. Um, and I thank you for, for tuning in and watching today. And so I think, I think I don't, seeing no more questions, we'll wrap up. So I just want to thank my guests today, Michael Mandel from PPI and Jennifer Huddleston from the American Action Forum. Thanks for joining me, guys. Thanks very much, Alex. Thanks for having us, Alec. Thanks. Bye. Bye.